watching We Heart Therapy. I'm your host, Dr. Annabelle Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT therapist here in fabulous Las Vegas. And actually, I think I'm going to have you guys start calling me your EFT guru because I kind of feel like that's what I am. <laughs> the EFT guru because I'm all about EFT. And we have an exciting guest today. You guys might remember we have Lori Brubaker. She's one of our beloved EFT trainers. She's back east in the Carolinas. She is the trainer and the, the head of the Carolina Center for EFT. She's an adjunct at University of North Carolina, Greensboro. And she has a book out, Stepping into Emotionally Focused Couple Therapy. And it is available online. And she's going to talk more about that at the end of the show. So thank you, everyone, for being with us. Thank you, Lori, for coming back and being a part of our show and talking to us today. And guys, so we're gonna get right in it. What we're gonna talk about today is attachment injury repair model. And Lori's gonna help us dive into a discussion about what that is, when you use it, what it looks like. Um, just a real basic snapshot of this because there seems to be a lot of questions that I've heard buzzing around the community, especially around some of the newer EFT folks as to what this is and when we use it. So Lori, if you could kind of help us out and maybe just give a brief um, overview as to what the attachment, attachment injury repair model is. <laughs> yes, thank you for having me, Annabelle. It's great to see you again. You do so many great uh, promos for educating people on EFT. I admire you for doing that. So I'm happy to talk and share what I can about the attachment injury resolution model is actually uh, what it's called uh, formally. And um, um, it seems that, I agree, there has been some confusion. I, I guess the one thing that we need to be clear on is that it really is a stage two process. And we know that um, when we have couples coming in with different kinds of betrayals, that since we know there is an empirically validated model for resolving attachment injuries, for, for repairing the trust when it's been broken, uh, it's easy to become eager to, let's use that right away. And that's not unlike when we start practicing EFT. We think we know about this blame or softening change event that has to happen for the couple to have enduring change, to feel a secure bond. Um, and so we want to get to it. And we sometimes miss valuing and validating the importance of what we do in stage one. So first, I guess I'd like to just talk about what is an attachment injury. And um, as early as 1994, Simpson and Rolls did uh, in the early adult attachment research, um, they talked about how incidents in which one partner fails to respond, responds or fails to respond to a moment of urgent need it can have a disproportionate effect on the relationship from that point forward. So there's already that clarity that in attachment bonds, when there's one moment that that can change everything. So and let me, so let me jump in real quick, if that's okay. And see if, you know, we can, um, if I can dissect this a little bit um, or go into it. So what I hear you saying, um, Lori, is that an attachment injury and, and maybe the lay therapist would kind of see this as a wound in the relationship. There's a particular, probably some particular event or a time where, you know, a partner really needed the other person and they weren't there for them. They didn't respond. And a lot of times these uh, the most obvious ones are probably some of the events they say that caused them to come into therapy, like an affair or something. Sometimes it's maybe the certain events that you see mm -hmm. your kind of going back to and bringing up, which is a sign that there's a wound there. Um, right. and it can occur in many different ways. It can be an obvious event or even something like, I just won this really big award and you seem to not care about it. This was my big moment and you just, you know, played on your computer and didn't say anything, you know, it, it can you know, seem like a less obvious event, but still cause the same hurt in the relationship. Right. I think I like the way you're stressing that it is an event, right? It, that it's definitely different than the gradual ev erosion of trust in a relationship. And I think that's a really important thing for us as therapists to be aware of. Mm -hmm. And um, there were a few things you mentioned I wanted to pick up on. So there's that it is, there is an event and 
Johnson and Mackin and Malkin first defined it in 2001, defined an attachment injury as an incident when one partner fails to respond to the other in a moment of urgent need. So that was part of the definition. So I guess you'd want to look at the, um, the example you gave of someone um, um, not celebrating with you when you just won a big award, if that is an attachment injury by definition, you know, whether was it a moment of need, a vulnerable, a vulnerable moment when you failed to get the comfort and caring you needed, or was it perhaps one of the many things that happen again and again in this relationship? When I'm excited about something and reach out to you, you seem to care more about something else. So you'd want, you want to find out. And you're right, a lot of couples come into therapy where the wound is gaping. <laughs> Other times we discover attachment injuries when they just kind of seep out and people say, yeah, there was this thing, but it's no big deal. Um, you often find out about attachment injuries in the assessment when you ask about pivotal moments that the relationship changed. But sometimes people don't bother to mention some of those. And they, the way that this, um, this whole dynamic was discovered was that Sue and her colleagues noticed that there were relationships that were failing to repair right? They were doing great. They got through the de-escalation change event. They were doing much better. They got through withdrawal re-engagement that both partners were engaged now. And yet the moment when the more pursuing partner went to reach, like in the step seven, in that vulnerable reach that happens in that major blame or softening change event, they stopped. You know, had trauma kind of flashback type reactions and said, no, no, never again will I trust. But, so that never again can I trust moment sometimes emerges in stage two, like comes roaring out of the closet, yeah. <laughs> like a ghost, right? So um, we, we just, we need to be sensitive along the way when we're working and we, we have lots of ways we can work with it when it is what couples come bring us in, in their initial. Um, so if I can, if I can interject again, so um, it's, one of the big things that you mentioned at the beginning is that the, and, and I think some of the confusion is it sounds like the name of this keeps changing because it used to be the repair model. But well, I don't know that it ever was. I think it's got, it may be, we may have added to the, to the confusion by our website for our attachment injury resolution model training program. We call it attachment injury repair yeah. simply for, um, you know, because we're using it as a, as a site but um um but I, I i do think in the literature i i don't know if it's ever called that in the literature but we're always talking about repairing the injury so yeah. Yeah. Um, and there is there is some confusion in the literature like the most recent i can talk about that a bit if you want but the most recent um article in 2013 that zuccarini um johnson dogleish and mackinan i believe wrote um you know where it was really a process of change study where they so we have this lovely article which shows us the client processes, the therapist tasks, and the therapist interventions that are used. We know what the key elements of change that we need to, to um, facilitate and how we can do that. Um, and that makes it very clear that it's eight steps that have, that it's basically a series of enactments. I, I think I like to make things as simple as I can to to. to use it and to teach it. So it's really a series of enactments and we can talk about that. But uh, some of the literature kind of maybe melds one or two steps. So you end up with seven steps or expands the last step and you end up with nine steps. But so if you're confused, I'd say look at Zuccarini et al's article if you really want to get clear. Or, I mean, that's what I repeat in my book. That's what I've repeated in several articles just so that, you know, but it's all about, it's about more than forgiveness. In a way, you know, it's about, it is about repairing or resolving, you know, having ongoing trust. So. so let's talk about that a little bit because, you know, one of the things you mentioned is that, you know, sometimes when a couple presents to therapy, even in their first session, these, you know, attachment injuries are, are really raw and they're bleeding out and they're really like, help us solve this. And, and I'm mean, really angry and they're just yeah, fed up with yeah. why do we have to keep talking about that? I said I was sorry. It's their, just their big source of distress and they're like, help us overcome this affair or, or this moment. And so yeah. the therapist can kind of take on the sense of urgency, like, okay, let's try to, you know, facilitate some kind of little repair around this so then we can get on to the rest of the therapy so that this doesn't become a block. 
but it sounds like, and from what I've learned too, is that if we do the, if we try to do the attachment injury re repair resolution too early in the work, it won't hold because we haven't built that safety. So even though you may have one partner apologizing and, you know, I'm so sorry, I totally get this. A lot of times the other partner just can't take it in. And so it falls short. And then you get that part of the cycle where I'm always having to apologize and I can't apologize right. anymore. It's not only that the partner can't take in the apology, it's that the core element of forgiveness and resolution is not happening in that way because it, in a way, by saying, I'm so sorry, I've told you I'm sorry, is like, it's, it's a way of shutting down the conversation. It's not like, let me hear how much you're hurting. Show me your wound. Show me how it's hurting. I, I want to get that. But when you haven't de-escalated yet, the offending partner can't do that. But it triggers the cycle. So it, it's uh, so hard. I mean, when you, especially when you already know that you caused an injury or, or a hurt to your partner and you, you get it. Like I get why I've hurt you, that this is really hurtful. And then it feels like to constantly tell me about your pain, you know, can feel like oh, it's kind of like rubbing my nose in my mistake. And of course no one wants to do that. So they tend to avoid hearing their partner's pain. Cause it's like, I got it. I understand. Why do we have to keep going into this? What's, what's the importance of continuing to go over this? Exactly, right, which is ugh, like this is really hard on me to talk about it. They might not be saying that thing. And so this is where our simple, rich model of EFT is really helpful because we know that we have to do stage one before we can do stage two. Or in other terms, we know that we need to help a couple um, discover how they're stuck and how, particularly in the cases that you mentioned, I think the question is, how are you stuck that you can't have the forgiving injuries conversation yet. You can't have a talk about how much that hurt and how, how I get how much you're hurting and I feel you're hurt in my heart and I have remorse and empathy. None of that can happen in stage one. Yeah. Just like whether there's an injury or not, if we start trying to get our couples in stage one, can't you understand your partner? No. No, they can't empathize fully with their partner in stage one because anything about listen to what's going on for your partner can trigger their biggest attachment fears. Like, uh-oh, you're saying it's all my fault. Uh-oh, you don't really want to be with me. So first we help them notice how they're stuck in a conversation mm -hmm. that keeps going round and round. And is, you know, the simple example I think you're giving is, let me talk about it to you. Let me tell you how bad I feel. Or let me ask you a thousand questions about why you did that. And it's like, no, 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 we've already done that. So we need to just move into that and say, oh, this is how you guys are stuck. The more you want to talk and ask about this event that broke your heart, that, that crushed you, the more you hear, I, I feel so bad already. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Or every time we talk about it, it just gets worse. Nothing I can say or do helps my partner feel any better. And then we say, that's right. It doesn't, it, it doesn't help yet. But let's just look at how it goes. And we hear from both of them. We do the tango. You know, we track how it goes. And then we do the tango. We say, we choose which person are we going to really um, work with. Because really the tango is a, you know, the tango is tracking within and between. And then by the time you get to the second move of the tango, you're deepening and assembling the process of one partner. So it could be the injured or the offending partner. We do both in stage one, right? We have each of them described. And the hurt partner here is maybe for the first time. They may not like it yet, but they're hearing what the experience of their partner is. And they hear it in an enactment. So when their partner turns and shares a lot can happen in stage one towards de-escalation. Yeah. Right? I really, you know, you said something and it really felt good. So I was like, oh, you know, I had this little deep breath. Like, oh, that felt so good to hear this part where, you know, you kind of openly say, that's right. It doesn't feel good yet. Yeah. Yeah. But we're going to, we're going to see how this happens between you guys and work towards that, you know, which feels so validating because oftentimes when clients throw that at us, a lot of therapists feel like a deer in the headlights, like, 
oh my god like yeah like what did i do wrong and how can i get the person to start trusting or like you said earlier sometimes people will say the offending partner keeps apologizing and it doesn't take or they can't receive it well that's just not what they need so yes they can't so we say you know this doesn't you still don't trust at all you are still so angry that your partner could turn to another person or so angry that your partner lied to you and that's yeah well that just reminds me that the key thing too is that the attachment injury is not about the event yeah. right it's about the attachment significance that it has so it may not be the affair like we can't assume to know what the event is often it's less about i don't care that he or that she had that affair what i care about is the deception mm -hmm. oh you care you know it's like somehow that my partner would turn and lie to me is like don't i count am i just the garbage like i you know and so that's um a part of what we really need to hear from from people so we don't get caught in the content and i love these beautiful ways that you frame things and you know i noticed and and i myself have become folly to this and i know it's it's you know it's hard as the human as the therapist who really wants to help the couple heal to not take on that sense of urgency when the couples come in and dump it on our lap and say this hurts so much help us feel better and we're going through the cycle and we're trying to, we know that it's important, but yet the client doesn't yet know why are we mapping this, you know, what happens between us? Why aren't we just jumping to the place where we talk about this and make yeah. it feel better? And, and it is something that we as therapists do struggle with, you know, some self of the therapist, like, I feel like I'm failing them or they feel like I'm failing them because I'm not handing them this, you know, bow tied, <laughs> you know, fixed injury repair, you know. Right, right. And I think one of the things that helped me most in terms of understanding the model and, you know, there's this, there is this resolution model, but how do we work with it in, in stage one? I, I was confused for a while about stage one because I thought, and I think this is what you're kind of talking about that, I mean, you're talking about one thing, which is the therapist's urge to make things better, right? So that's another paradigm, but we all get stuck in that, right? But, but this other thing about um, 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 how, what's the cycle? If we're doing de-escalation first, what's the cycle we're trying to de-escalate? And I think people often get stuck down, you know, pathways of we have to figure out what the cycle we have to figure out why you had the affair, you know, and that's not what we're doing. But what helped me the most is to say, to, to, to um, understand that what we're trying to do is we're trying to track the current cycle because I, uh, Sue always says you track the present cycle. Often it's the same cycle that led to the affair, but regardless, that's too much information, right? We've got a couple in high distress. And what we're trying to do, guys, is we're trying to track how you get stuck. What's the thing that keeps happening between the two of you that you can't even have a conversation that helps resolve this injury? Because you're still hurting so much and you're still feeling so crappy and ready to, pick, to do whatever you could do, but nothing works yet. So what we're going to look is how does it go when you um, you know, how do you get stuck that you can't have this conversation yet? Mm -hmm. So then whatever content they bring up, it's not that we can't talk about the affair we, or the injury, if it was a, you know, betrayal around finances or what have you, or you weren't there for me when I was, my mother died and I was in the hospital and I called you and you couldn't be bothered. You know, these are all, you know, pivotal moments or had a miscarriage and you couldn't be bothered leaving your golf game to come and pee with me. But what, what we want to, what we want to track is how they get stuck that they can't talk about it. Right? Yeah. And that seems to, you know, to say that's what we're going to do because you're still hurting so much. Both of you are hurting. And then we help to validate in stage one that the injured partner is hurting too. Um, I have one of these uh, um, soon to be, um, I think on my book, on my book website for a training tape, a, a, a client who, who then, you know, as we're doing stage one, he's, he's the injured partner and, and he's talking about how much he's hurting and that this cycle happened before the affair. It's happening right now. Like she will try to hold back. He had an affair. She will try to hold back until she blows. And then there's this big explosion and he feels hurt by the explosion, of course. But he talks about having, 
lived so long trying and trying to get things right with her that they had this kind of pattern and they worked for quite some time with their own therapist but we had this pattern where I was trying and trying to get it right with her and she's still angry with me just like now trying to repair from this affair and I finally said to myself it's not me I've been thinking what's wrong with me what am I doing wrong it's not me I'm not always in the wrong so then he takes a more defensive you know um uh, position which doesn't help either right but I can validate how much he's hurting he can talk about how much he's hurting and how he does put up his back and back away when he's hurting and she's kind of there she knew all the time he digs his heels in the sand as, as she called it but she hasn't heard it directly expressed to him in an enactment to talk about how he's hurting that she's so angry and so hurt and that he's the bad guy. So these don't sound like reparative comments, but when we know that all of this is reparative in towards de-escalation, towards the couple getting enough safety to say the problem we're caught in is this cycle, right? Where the more I cry or rant or pull away as the injured partner, the more the other partner apologizes profusely and then gets frustrated because nothing works. Yeah. I find too, I, you know, you're saying some really wonderful things and it really calls to mind, you know, that one of the places, and I, I find this more, especially with non EFT therapists, I find it's a lot easier with EFT therapists, but um, a lot of therapists have a hard time. And even the, the injured person has a hard time believing that the injuring partner actually does have pain that you know, a lot of times what they've done, the hurt that they've caused was, you know, their own, like I was at my breaking point, I was either so hurt or what I did was something that was completely out of character. And I have all this shame because I caused this huge hurt and I did something that also betrayed myself because it wasn't who I ever wanted to be or, or ever how I ever saw myself behaving. And so, you know, also in stage one, it can be hard for the pursuer to hear you've got pain yeah right this is this is about me you're you know yeah. you did the bad thing of you course know. of course so that's right that's fine if it's like i don't want to hear your pain and the therapist will validate that you don't really care right now that your partner is hurting and feeling badly about what happened you're saying i just need you to hear my pain and i'm so angry with you yeah and sometimes even helping them say that's it and helping them express the anger coherently even though uh we're not like heightening the secondary emotion mm -hmm. it's also kind of you know hurt is anger sadness and fear mm -hmm. of rejection and abandonment so i think we as therapists um try to stay away from the anger per speaking honestly for myself as i watch recordings of stage one um attachment injury work i think I should have I should have gone for the anger more because that is what that's what's there. I mean, that, I, and somehow you sometimes miss it. But I I recall in one session where I said to the um, injured partner, "Can you tell him I'm angry?" And she was so dysregulated, and she was like, oh. she didn't want to be angry, right? She's like, no. Oh. But then she started, and this was the most coherent thing she said to him, and it always helps. Right? She said you weren't there and whoa, and you weren't there. And then she just, you know, when she was able to dissolve into her, or her sadness, which came from that anger, it, it, was, it was helpful. But if I had been too um, afraid to help her express the anger that, keeps, that she keeps, you know, blasting out in moments of panic, um, it wouldn't have been as useful for them in moving forward. Because when you find out your partner can hear the anger, you know, you can, you can, the therapist can validate, of course, you're very, very angry. How could he have done this? How could he have turned to someone else? Or, or right at that moment when your mother was dying and you needed him more than ever. Right or or if it's a thirty year old well if it's a thirty year old injury it probably isn't coming out in stage one so I shouldn't make that comment right now. <laughs> well, maybe it is, but I love that you're saying that, and it's so true. A lot of therapists, and I myself for a while was taught, you know, oh, there's something deeper underneath anger, you know, kind of just glaze over the anger to go deeper to whatever's underneath. But you know, there's the client really needs 
to be seen and heard in that place where they're angry. And a lot of they have it validated. Yeah. And they have this fear that if I touch the anger, if I validate it, and again, we're talking about validating the emotion of anger, the attachment needs or longings or hurts behind the anger, not the behavioral reaction. You know, um, they're afraid if I touch that, it's going to make it worse, which actually the opposite ends up happening. You know, if you can meet them like, I get that this is such a angry place for you, you know, then it's like, oh, you see me, my, my anger is like, it's okay to be angry. It's understandable. It may not be okay what they do <laughs> with that anger. But... Well, but that's what we're going to find out too. We're gonna, yeah. So when the anger comes up, like it's coming up right now, how do you typically respond? Right. I mean, that's the kind of stuff we do in, you yeah. know, in steps one or steps two and three, but um, we find, you know, well, well, I guess I either blast him or I just, I just walk away in anger. I don't even say anything because I'm giving up. So then we can, oh, it feels like you said, I would just say, you're saying, I'm afraid to be angry. My anger feels like it's going to just, just push my partner away. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah, that's the fear. If I show, if I even feel it, let alone put it out there, I'm afraid my partner's going to walk away. And that's not what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So they can talk about, um, you know, we can assemble that more and assemble however they go with that. But they're, but the, they can then probably access the pain a little more. And it sounds they, like throughout yeah. stage one, we're kind of planting seeds or little building blocks towards the attachment injury resolution in stage two. And sometimes even though we're, we're not doing like, ex you know, the model in stage one, there are some mini reparative comments or enactments that will help, you know, especially as they begin to get closer towards de-escalation, even for the injuring partner to say, you know, I do hurt, your hurt causes me hurt. And sometimes, you know, that can help, you know, bring the betrayed partner down because they know that, okay, in some ways you do have remorse, even though we haven't gotten to the place where we've had that conversation. You know, the fact that my hurt matters to you can help them kind of diffuse a little bit and set us up for a good place to work with this in stage two. Like any stage one work, right? That all these conversations can be helpful, but the, most of all what we're wanting is, is not just to diffuse. We're wanting the couple to be aware of how they set each other off balance, how they knock each other off balance and they feel that they're back to, to where they started, right? So that they can really notice it's, um, it's when I most need you that I push you away. It's when I'm most hoping I'm going to meet with your approval that I walk away, right? That they get that and they're able to see that that's, you know, and that I think you're right. We are planting seeds, right? We're, we're, what we're doing, I think we're planting attachment seeds all throughout our work, right? But the way we're doing it in stage one with a, with an attachment injury that's very clear is we're like, this is how, for an example, you guys can't have this conversation yet. Uh, you so much want your partner's comfort. You so much want them to understand how much you're hurting. And you guys can't do that yet, right? Because each time your partner talks to you about the hurt or doesn't talk about the hurt and you just get written on their face, you feel bad and try to gloss over them or whatever it is, right? So we can't have that comforting conversation yet where you can really move through that incident. And so, right, like the first day of school is forever going to be terrible because that's the day, you know, that this thing happened. That's how it feels right now. It feels like for, the, for 16 more years, that first day of school is going to pierce through your heart, right? We haven't been able, to, you guys haven't yet been able to have the conversation which can change those feelings about that first day. It'll always be a memory, but we haven't been able to have that conversation yet where you really sense your partner gets your pain and can reach in and comfort you and make a difference. So, you know, that's almost like psycho ed, but we're not teaching. We're just pointing out you haven't been able to do that yet, but we will be able to. But I think in some ways we are paint showing the pathway, right? We're saying you don't trust yet. You're still really angry. You're still feeling so bad that you keep disappearing. We know the path to get there. First, we want to really find, make it safe enough to go there. Yeah, and I love just the way that you're really carving this out really explicitly in terms of the pattern, you know, to me still feels like it has a calming effect. Well, of course, and it does because it helps the couple deescalate, but just to feel like 
Yes. Yes, this is where we get stuck. We do try to have these conversations, but something comes up, something gets in the way, and we're not able to feel better about it at the end. We're not able to repair and connect, and we're stuck there. Yeah. So we're really working on how do we get stuck there. And, and some of the – oh, sorry. But – some of the calming effect comes from us in being able to get the value of de-escalation and to really get that this is what we're doing and that we keep saying, right, this is what we're doing. Right? And that we have the confidence that there is a pathway towards resolution. Uh, we just aren't ready for that yet because we understand that you can't do blame or softening before a withdrawal is re-engaged. So, um, so you, you, we couldn't expect... And, and the offending partner to listen to all the pain without getting triggered, right? It's the same kind of thing, right? So um, it's, you know, that's where it just, it's a re-injury if we say, like, spill yeah. your guts, talk about your pain now, because there's your partner, you, are you ready to listen? And they say, sure. But if you're really too in, yeah. And so um, that's why uh, we want it. We need to know that there's a time to do it. But also, sometimes the offending partner is the is the pursuer, of course, right? At times, it's the the more um, uh, you know the there's more. Yeah. So if the if the <clears throat> when the withdrawer has been injured, well, now I'm sort of starting to talk about the actual. Um, attachment injury resolution model so maybe you want maybe we should finish uh, a bit more with stage one so it sounds like so we're really stage one is is about you know how do we get stuck in this place where we're not able to have this reparative conversation and feel you know connected have a hold me tight conversation you know mm -hmm. how do we get stuck not being able to have that not being able to feel better after. And we're gonna work on a path forward to that and really validating, of course, we're stuck here. Yeah, we're not ready for that place. You guys haven't been ready. You haven't, maybe you haven't understood why we can't get to that place, but that's what we're gonna really work on here. Well, we're not really working on why because then we're getting caught in insight therapy, but we're working on how you get stuck mm -hmm. and we're boldly um, naming the injury when they are like when it's right there if we don't know about it yet and no one's mentioned it that's different but when we know about the the injury we keep putting it into the cycle right so every time you see this or hear that you immediately you're like uh oh i'm in trouble this is going to bring up the this is going to bring up the all that stuff from my partner again and i'm going to be in trouble so i find myself pulling back more and more or you know, I had this example where this couple had done so well and they were feeling so good and the offending partner was doing all this reparative stuff and things were great and then things changed. Well, that the offending partner was feeling like this still isn't enough. My partner's still not happy. Like, what, I can't, I give up. I, I mean, it wasn't a give up, but it was, I'm going to do less. Like, what the hell, right? Well, of course it wasn't enough yet, right? It wasn't enough because the injury wasn't repaired. That they were kind of in a pattern of thinking, if I if I'm kind enough and you know bring enough flowers and do enough, maybe it will make up for it. So we we want to help people. Um, we we want to help people talk about how that affair is a or other injury is a clear part of their cycle. And sometimes we have multiple attachment injuries. Mm -hmm. So you know we have someone who. You know, you know, hurt. You know, did did one kind of injury. Someone who did another, and they're both feeling hurt. So we put both of those into the cycle. How their how their experiences about those injuries are uh, triggering their behaviors and triggering one another to just um, pull back more and ramp up more. Yeah, and for me, I guess the why is the same as the how is the cycle. The cycle is why we get stuck and how we get stuck, but I know we don't uh -huh. like the why, but yeah, that's, that's, and that's so beautiful. And it sounds like as we transition to stage two, so will we, so it sounds like we need to go through withdrawal re-engagement, you know, continuing to, to set the stage for the resolution model that we can't just, oh, we're in stage two, let's talk about this. We still have to engage the withdrawer um, so that whether it's the healing they need to receive or the, you know, um, remorse that they need to share, you know, that they're 
or the pain that they need to hear from their partner that they're engaged and can stay present with whatever we need to do in the model. And then we'd go into blamer softening, pursuer softening, which is, you know, either I need to share my pain with you and ask for, you know, repair or forgiveness or so, so maybe you can, you know, let's talk more about that. What, when do we get to that in stage two? Well, it's like, we look for indications when we have de-escalated, right? When the couple um, gets there, um, you know, understands how they get stuck. And um, when we're ready to move into stage two, it depends who, it also, it, yes, we will have done um, withdrawal re-engagement um, if, if the pursuer is the injured partner, right? Because if it's the kind of situation where you possibly don't know about the injury yet, that I talked about at the beginning, you know, what prompted this whole process to be developed was the times when the pursuer withdrawal had re-engaged and the pursuer was about to make that vulnerable reach and the old, uh-oh, never again will I trust kicked in. They hadn't been that aware of it themselves. Like I, um, I write in my book about this example, which is changing a lot of details, but I lived it with clients, right? The, the offending partner was not aware of it. It was 30 years old and the offending partner hadn't really thought it was that big a deal either anymore, right? Hadn't, hadn't been focused on it, but then um, talked about it, said, no, no, can't do it, can't reach. 30 years ago, and then she had this story of what happened, right? And so that, that, then we went through the, through the, um, the whole process which, um, of, of repairing that injury. But I, I just want to say that, um, like Sue has said, that if the, if the uh, injured partner is the withdrawer, the attachment injury resolution process is kind of takes, becomes the withdrawer re-engagement event. <laughs> when, when the withdrawer and um, um, when the withdrawer is the injured uh, partner, I have a, a, some situations of where the withdrawer, and, and it's written in some of the um, articles, when the withdrawer is about to step into the relationship in a more assertive way to say, you know, like, I want to know that I matter to you. I need you to back off, stop giving me such a hard time, or, you know, I want to have a part in this relationship just like you. You know, can you, can you make space for me to have some influence too? When they're about to step in in that assertive way, they... Um, um, also, like, uh, uh, no, no, I, I'm not, I'm not going to, like, I, there's, there's, I can't do this because I don't think that she ever, you know, I don't think my partner wants me. Ever since, did you know, and it gets kind of incoherent too. It's kind of like, like ever since that Disney and, and the partner's like, what are you talking about Disney? Well, that incident that happened five years ago when, you know, I suddenly had this health problem and, you got mad at me and you said, then I'll go to Disney with the kids without you. Like I just felt discarded at that moment. So this is like a, a total shock to, to the other partner. And we go through that. We go through the process of, of um, increasingly vulnerable disclosures of the, of the pain of the injury um, so that um, it can be healed. So. So it sounds like part, two, it depends on if it's the withdrawer or the pursuer that's yeah. the injured partner it will depend on how we work with the um, resolution model in stage two. Well, it's about which what we're going to do first, right? Like we know we need withdrawal re-engagement before we can do the blame or softening for the pursuer. At least we need some withdrawal re-engagement. They're probably going to re-engage more. I mean, you know, these like an attachment injury is a relationship trauma. And so you, it's like working with trauma. And so a lot of times with trauma, stage two is a bit more of a laddering, right? Each time you have a little bit more engagement with the withdrawer, maybe not full engagement yet, at least you might feel pretty good about it, but after you have some pursuer softening, you get more engagement with you know, the withdrawer and it, it builds in, in a positive sort of way. But either way, the, the basic model is, um, can be a great guide for us. It's like a mini model within the model. That's how I have often talked about it, but in other ways so that it doesn't get more complicated and people think, what, we've got nine steps, now we've got another little eight steps. You know, you can really think of it more as when you're, 
you know, it becomes the withdrawers re-engagement or the blame or softening. And sometimes you don't need more than that. Sometimes, um, you know, that's enough of a change event that you don't need any, any, you know, any more. Sometimes there's multiple injuries and you don't have to go through all of them because it has a, it's a corrective emotional experience. And then um, some the consolidation part of therapy is a way that some of these other um, incidents are, are resolved as well. But did you think of what happened before with my couples where, um, you know, well, there'll be one, you know, injury that they might, you know, touch on in stage one, but then there's a, something else bigger. And then as we heal the bigger thing, the other person says, you know, I don't, I don't really feel like I need to, you know, I feel a lot better, you know? Right. Because that, and then that reminds us, it's not about the content. It's about the injury, injurious moment that said to me, I can't trust you. Now we've healed this bond and I can trust you. You get my pain. You've reassured me. I've seen on your face that you feel my pain. I experience empathy in a way I haven't before from you over this incident and I trust you. So the bond is there and it's like, yeah, that's what happened then too. <laughs> but it's like, it doesn't, it, it doesn't have to be, uh, it's not like, it's not like separate little wounds all over. It's right. the attachment wound. That's right. Yeah, that's so, nice. So let me, with the attachment injury repair model, and I love how you said, you know, you're mentioning steps of it. So um, I want, you know, folks to know this is not scary. You know, the yeah. attachment injury repair is like a mini model within the model, kind of like the uh, dancing, the EFT tango is some mini steps within the broader steps, you know, like an in session map you know, versus the steps and stages between. So this is like a little mini model. And really it's, it's our own little map for how do we deal with these yes. really big moments, these injuries, you know, so that we can go through these because sometimes these are moments that we need to come to that are, you know, obviously enveloped in their overall cycle, but we still need to come back to it specifically and deal with it. So in the, in the process of the attachment injury repair resolution model, Will we do like a specific session around this? Will we weave it into the stage two steps and stages? Well, you yeah, it's part of stage two and you might have, you know, you might have multiple sessions. It really, really depends on the couple. And, and, and so I think that's, I think what's important is that we, we have this basic map, the basic map of what needs to happen for a couple to repair an attachment injury a moment that the trust was broken in a snap, right? What, so it's different than the general cycle that's eroded. So what needs to happen? So first, there, like there are eight steps. I always find it helpful to look at the steps so I get a sense of it. Um, and, you know, it's, but if they overwhelm you, maybe you want to look at it more simply. But the thing is, the eight steps, there's like a de-escalation of the injury, right? So, but, well, let me say, the simple thing is, I see it as a series of, um, enactments of increasing vulnerability. So anyway, the first four steps are called de-escalation of the injury. So in the first step, the um, injured partner describes the event that changed everything for them. Right? So this is also where it's helpful that we have this little mini model because we're basically not um, wanting to be focused on content in EFT, but we use the couple's content to and go just, with process. Just to ask real quick about that. So when we start to go into this, will we actually like explicitly set this up with a couple and say, I think you guys are ready for us to have this conversation or let's let's work on trying to have this specific conversation now and see, you know, what happens or or do we set it up at all? Explain. Well, I guess I I don't quite um I suppose again it would depend. I I don't um typically do i don't think i've ever quite done that it's it's more if i would i still do it more um exactly. incidentally with what they're giving me so it's like so you guys are aware that you you know you've you you're you're feeling much safer you know how you get stuck you're having many more um calm times together and yet there's this there's this big event that is still gnawing away at both of you right and so if, if they have de-escalated, 
So I feel we can go into that. I might just ask the injured partner, can you talk about what it was about that event, right? Like, you know, they might say, you know, they might have talked about the event before, but I would help them um, specifically talk about the, the event. Now this, or this is, imagine, imagine, let's imagine that it just showed up for the first time, like the example I was giving you, right? Where she said, nope, never again will I trust him. 30 years ago, I got pregnant before we were married and he suggested I have an abortion. And that just changed everything. Like my, our child, he wants me to get rid of our child. Like I never trusted him since. But anyway, so, so then we're talking specifically about the injury. Yeah, so, right, the injury that just showed up. But if it was the affair that brought them in, you might say, can we go back? Now that, you know, now that we have the safety that we can talk about this, can you go back? Can we go back to what was it about that? Um, I remember you saying, it's not, it's not her. I'm tired of her name. What, what I want, what was so bad were the lies, right? And so the, the specific, or maybe it wasn't the lies, maybe it was, it was when I said, when I was so angry and you said, well, I guess let's plan how we can separate then. And you started to talk about where we could each live. That was the moment. So, but you have them talk about it. You, sh I typically would ship an enactment fairly, um, you know, this is what I'm so angry about, that you could do this, right? Or this is what is hurting so much underneath that you could do this. And I lost the person I trust. The partner at that point is often likely to minimize or say, well, yeah, but you know, I'm sorry, I've told you, or what's the point in going over this again, right? But we validate that and then, but it, it's getting safer so that the next part of this de-escalation is helping the injured partner share um, more, assemble more of the emotion to make more sense. So this really is about attachment. This is about you know, how you are so important to me. It's about you being important. It's not about you being a jerk. So we're helping them. I mean, they might still be saying, but you are a jerk that you could have done this. But So we help them disclose that more. And then this is the fourth, the fourth like response from the offending partner that has a really key element. First of all, we've been helping them hear that it's more than just about the baddie, the thing they did. It's about how important you are and, and how, how, you know, you were knocked off the horse. You know, you were, you know, you were, you were off the pedestal and suddenly, you know, this is, the, this is the injury. We're helping them hear that. And they're starting to maybe hear some of that now. That this is, we're validating them. We're validating and reflecting so much in these first four steps of the model. And then we're also saying, how is it that it could have happened? Like, how is it that you could have? Like in my training video, the actual phrase is, how is it that you could have stabbed her in the back? Because she used that phrase. It's like, you having an affair with my best friend was like a stab in the back, right? And so I'm very carefully holding the alliance, knowing that we're okay, and also knowing that, that this is part of the model and the injured partner needs to hear, how could you have done this? So they become predictable again. If somebody says, I don't know, it was such a... What do you say in that moment when you say, how is it that you could have done this? I mean, whoa, that's, that sounds like a really loaded question. <laughs> it is a loaded question in a way, but if, if we can't touch that, then how would I ever trust you again? Right? So, you know, the person who suggested, um, you know, have an abortion says, I was afraid. I didn't, I didn't know how to be a father. I, I, I just wanted to run. It's true. I just wanted to run. I didn't want to, um, you know, I didn't know how to, I didn't know what to do with your parents who were going to be upset. I didn't know what to do. I was just, I was just terrified. And I, and I, so even that's a pretty, that's a dicey thing to be saying. It's true. I wanted to run. I just wanted to get out of this relationship because I was so scared. That's how I could suggest it. You know, or that like this question is kind of like helping the injuring partner make a clear, coherent sense of how they came to make the injury or do how they could do such a bad thing, <laughs> like it's such a hurtful thing. And in the training video that people can purchase, the fellow says, When I say, How is it that you could have stabbed her in the back? He says, He says, um, something like anger, I guess. I guess I was so angry with her because they had a little breakup and then he had an affair with her friend. He said, I guess it was, it was spite. That's what he said. It was spite. 
he said, you know, as bad as it sounds, man, you can feel you can feel that he's congruent, but also feeling that, you know, he, he's he's acknowledging. He's, I guess it was just spite. I wanted to make her hurt, like I was hurting, you know. And so when people say stuff like that, their partners aren't usually revving up in reaction. They're usually like, yeah. really, like you're saying. It's like. It's like the salt that gets poured in the wound, but it's just kind of like saying, here's the salt. Like I, this was bitter and I did it. And, and I did it for this reason, but they start to make sense. I can make sense out of you being spiteful and wanting to hurt me back. I can make sense of you being so afraid to be a father, you want me to have an abortion or give up the baby for adoption. I can make sense of you being that afraid, right? Because I've never heard from you about this at all, so this is new, right? So that's the that's the part of the all. That's all part of the de-escalating the the injury, the first part of the model, and then the then the the forgiveness and reconciliation part of the AIRM are like the fifth and sixth steps. Sometimes these kind of merge together too, right? I mean, they do for me sometimes, but they are the most um, vulnerable conversations, right? I mean, they sound pretty vulnerable already. Uh, so it's really, it's, it's increasing vulnerability where we do lots of evoking and heightening um, as therapists and help the injured partner um, really get in touch, like experience and disclose the core of the injury. And, you know, people that have been angry and hurting so bad, they've got quite a protective skin too, right? So to actually feel, they're often, they kind of, they don't want to feel the pain, right? It hurts too much. But also the fear of feeling the pain when it might send their partner running is also dangerous. So that we now have increasing safety, enough safety they can tell their partner is in, enough safety for them to go to the core of their pain and share it. And now the partner doesn't react with minimizing or I, I told you I'm sorry, right? The partner is more likely to respond with, with empathy and remorse, but it's a different kind of, um, um, it's a different kind of remorse than the remorse that's been going on for a while, right? It's, I feel your pain. Like, um, like, that I feel so bad that I could do that to someone I love and care about so much, that I could stab you in the back when I love and care about you so much. Or, or that I could, you know, whatever the, the, the event. So that often what I hear people, you know, so that's the, this is like the, the five, sharing the depth of the injury, and then the six is the responding to that. And what often matters more to the, like in this, bonding, forgiving, rec, um, you know, resolution moment, what matters more to the um, hurt partner is what they see on the face of their partner. You know, they'll sometimes say, the words didn't really matter. I could see on your face that you get my pain. I can see on your face that you feel my pain. Yeah. And that's, you know, I was really... I'm crocodile here. Sometimes it's just about, like... Can I see some sign on your face that you are impacted by this, that this means something to you? Right. While you're telling me about your yourself and your tuning into me, right? And so those are, like, I was reading through some of my cases that I um, had published this morning to prepare for this meeting with you. And I found that when I got to this part, I was, like, getting goosebumps oh, over and over. I mean, some of them are cases I've lived, but I've usually changed them enough. Some I've created, you know, and, and yet I feel it. You know? <laughs> so it's really, it's a powerful, um, it's, it's such a powerful experience, this degree vulnerability and human experience that we can have these bonding moments where someone can be so vulnerable with their pain and the partner can be so open to and safe right if we didn't know about de-escalation we would never be helping people get there mm -hmm. that i can be safe enough to tune into how badly i have hurt you and i can start to feel the empowerment that i the injuring partner am making a difference like that is the most life-giving experience mm -hmm. for someone who's hurt the other and has lived with guilt and shut down and remorse, but they've been all alone in that. 
to now feel that I am the one that can make a difference. I, in my response to you, can make a difference and you feel better. So that it's not a shaming experience. It's actually quite a redemptive experience. Bonding and, yeah. Yeah, and very bonding, yeah. And then the consolidation um, are the steps um, seven and eight that follow that. You know, particularly just um, heightening how this is really, this, well, it, it can include um, more of the injured partner asking for what they need to to really feel safe and secure mm -hmm. uh, at this moment now and and more of a response from the offend who the person who was the offending partner um and then it's also sort of telling a new narrative about this event right so that together so this goes back into the stage two steps and stages you know the ask and bond mm -hmm. solutions to old problems you know i'm doing the little dance thanks scott woolley <laughs> So, you know, and oftentimes, you know, when we are able to overcome such a tremendous injury and create a hold me tight conversation and a bonding moment around it, it becomes so much easier for them to ask and reach and bond around other things. That's right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you have a training tape on this, right? Where can we yeah. find that? Um, it's on... It's on the ISEP website, but it's a bit complicated to find. I think you have to go under resources and then you have to go under online courses. Um, and then it still takes you to the same website, which is, um, um, it's attachmentinjuryrepair.com. Okay. Right, so that's where you can, you can get that. Um, it's, so it's a training, um, a training program as well as uh, there is a full session that you can watch. Um, and, but, the and program. how long mm -hmm. um to watch it I, I i almost forget we did this in 2014 i think it's about an hour the session is about an hour but the training program what it does um this it, it goes lillian buchanan and i did this and she developed these sort of modules it goes through each of the steps and stages up well it goes through each of the steps i'm sorry of the AIRM, and it, and then we show like the Zuccarini research. We show that the clients, um, what the client is doing, and what the therapist tasks are, right? And so we, you know, we have lots. Of, we have um, little exercises for it. Can be done as a training program in a group, or you can do it on your own. Um, a lot of supervisors have purchased it to use as a group, and then they, you know, they do it together as a group. And you can get NBCC. Um, continuing it credits by doing a little quiz as well but it goes through each of the um each of the stages and little exercises there's a few fun songs to help you remember the stages the steps i don't know where i'm using the word stages this morning and uh um so it i think it helps you get a felt sense of the model and it helps you kind of practice identifying interventions and that sort of thing so that's that's the one thing and um, and can they IR come straight off and get it there? Or do they have? They don't, to they don't have to go through ISEF either way. Um, it's not AIRM.com. It's attachmentinjuryrepair.com. That that is something else to do with airlines or something. Okay, but, okay. So I'll make sure that I put the link to this in the description for this video. Okay. And so you also have your book, Stepping Into Emotionally Focused Couples Therapy. Where can we find that? Well, you can go to Rutledge. It's published by Rutledge or Amazon. But you can also go to the book website, which I have a book website. And that um, website is steppingintoeft.com. Okay. And on that website, there is um, a description of each chapter. There's Scott Woolley's endorsement, a few other people's endorsements. There's a, a little introduction to the book. And then for the particular chapter on our topic for today, where I describe working with an attachment injury in step stage one and in stage two. There's examples of cases. Um, that's chapter 11. There's a little, um, there's a little uh, summary of each chapter on that website as well. So you get very, a tiny taste of what that's about. And then on the book website, there are also some videos that can be purchased. There's no, um, I had an attachment injury resolution model um, no, I had a stage one uh, video that I was going to um, 
put up, but uh, some things changed for that one. So I don't have one up yet, but I will. We're working with an attachment injury in stage one. So there's that. So I will make sure that we also put that in the description for the video. And just to tie a bow on all of this, guys, so in stage one, even though a couple may come in kind of pressing, let's deal with this now, we know that they aren't ready, that they're too escalated, and that's part of where their cycle is showing up is that they're not able to have this bonding and healing conversation at home where they're able to talk about this and come to resolve and feel better about it. And that's what we're really going to elicit throughout stage one and, and understanding how they get stuck in their cycle, not being able to have these kinds of conversations. And we're going to set the table for stage two, where we're going to work with this mini model within stage two to help facilitate a much deeper conversation. It's going to be on a different level. Um, mm -hmm. Stage two is a different level than stage one. Right. It's going to be a level that's much deeper that really helps them get to the place where they need, where this, where they're able to feel, you know, take it in to be able to tolerate pain and take in each other's pain, but also take in the repair and mm -hmm. the resolution and both couples, both partners can have a bonding and healing and reparative moment during stage two through this. Mm -hmm. Lori is so gracious. She's got some training materials that can help us go through this much more deeply because obviously there's a lot to this. And she has her books, so I'm going to put all the resources. What were you going to say? And one more thing is that I forgot to tell you earlier, I did an article in the ICEF newsletter on working with an attachment injury in stage one. Because we often feel, oh, we can't, if we can't do the resolution, we shouldn't be talking about it. So I did it. It was in 2015. But if you go to my website, which is albrubaker.com, and you go to publications, you can, get, you can find it. It's right there, working with an attachment injury in stage one. Excellent. So we will have both that website available. We will have the link to her book. We will have the link to the training video as well. So we'll have all of that up there for you guys so that you can find it in one place. And, you know, check out the other video that we did together um, about restoring trust in... Um, it was kind of a similar topic, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah <laughs> it kind of was. And we, we talk about lying and deception and gaslighting, all kinds of things involved in rebuilding trust with EFT. So if you guys haven't seen our prior video, make sure you check that out. And make sure you look up Lori if you're interested in having a training with her. Is your training schedule on yeah. your website? Um, some items aren't on yet. There's going to be a, a, a workshop on this topic in Northampton in March of 2019. So there, you can find that. Uh, it will be on our website or the coupleandfamilyinstitute.com is where they have it listed. And there'll be one in New Zealand, Auckland, New Zealand, November 13 and 14. So if you'd like to come to New Zealand, that would be a, a way to get this workshop too. <laughs> Absolutely. Or if you want to bring Lori out to your area to do this in your area, um, look her up. They can email you through your website. Mm -hmm. all right. Sure. Yeah. Send her an email and um, she will get you all the information you need to schedule her to come to your area and offer some of her amazing trainings. So thank you again, Lori, so much for taking the time to be with us and to really help us unpack this more deeply. Thank you, Annabelle. You're a great interviewer. I love working with you. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you so much to all of the viewers. I've gotten tremendous feedback from you guys. Thank you so much for supporting these resources. And keep subscribing because more videos are going to be coming. <laughs>